We're going to continue our discussion on epistemology by talking about the, the epistemological perspective of the empiricists, uh, those who stress uh, sensory experience as the foundation of knowledge. We're first of all going to talk about the empiricist John Locke. His last name is spelled L-O-C-K-E. Now, Locke believed that before we can analyze the world, we need to know something about ourselves. We need to know how we acquire knowledge. We also need to know which areas of inquiry Inquiry, inquiry we are able to pursue successfully. We, we need to know which areas of inquire, inquiry that we can't successfully engage in as well. In other words, which areas we can't pursue in principle. We further need to know what knowledge consists in. Now initially Locke places considerable emphasis on ideas. It's an emphasis that is ironically echoed by the rationalists. But Locke is somewhat ambiguous about his notion of ideas. On the one hand, he seems to argue that ideas are the only entities that our minds work with. So when, say, someone sees a chair, he doesn't really see the chair per se. He sees his idea of it, his mental representation of it. In this regard, Locke seems to embrace idealism. And you should write that word idealism uh, down because I'm going to give a definition to you uh, of idealism that will appear on your final exam. Here's the definition. Idealism. Idealism is the theory that mental events are the primary source for experience and knowledge for human beings. So again, idealism is the theory that mental events are the primary source for experience and knowledge for human beings. Now, some idealists who are on the extreme um, hold that there is nothing existing independent of mental events. That in fact, there is no external world. There is just our ideas of the external world and that's what we interact with. We don't actually exist with anything independent of those ideas. Other idealists hold that there is an external world, but we can't know it because our mental representations of it overwhelm our ability to experience it directly. So there is something out there, but we can't know what it's like, what its true nature is because we can only deal with our ideas of it um, and uh, not the thing itself. So on the, on the one hand, Locke appears to be an idealist. On the other hand, however, Locke seems to, to suggest that ideas are the means by which the mind makes perceptual contact with the external world. Ideas, in short, are acts of the mind that enable perceiving. Ideas act to allow me to actually perceive, say, a chair, for example. But one thing that Locke clearly rejects 
is the notion of innate ideas, an idea, uh, a notion that uh, we talked about when we talked about the rationalists. He points out that none of the mental content alleged to be innate is universally shared by all humans. He cites children and the mentally disabled as lacking innate ideas about, say, geometry. He also uses evidence from travel literature to point out that many non-Europeans lack knowledge of certain moral claims that Europeans take as innately obvious, like the Golden Rule. He points out that some groups even lack the idea of a god. Since these ideas are not shared by all humans, says Locke, so-called innate ideas are not implanted by God in human minds. Therefore, these ideas are acquired and are not innate. When we are born, he says, our minds are a what, what's called a tabula rasa, or in other words, a blank slate, like a blank chalkboard with nothing written on it. And the only reason we anything gets written on it is, is from experience. So how do how do experience and ideas of reflection? work together. Well, let's, let me go back uh, actually on, on this. How do we acquire ideas according to Locke? We should ask that first. There are two sources. The first source is experience. And by that he simply means what we learn through our five senses. The second source is what he calls ideas of reflection. Ideas of reflection are inner operations of the mind, things that the mind does on its own. These, these um, inner operations, these ideas of reflection, he gives many examples. One is memory, imagination, desire, doubt, judgment, and choice. Now we can ask, how do experience and ideas of reflection work together? Well, to begin with, experience pro provides us initially with simple ideas like colors, textures, temperatures, odor, kinds of tastes, and so on. But my ideas of things like a chair are not simple. I don't see its color and shape and feel its texture and so on all at once. That's because, says Locke, I also have complex ideas that reflect my mind combining simple ideas of a chair into an object that is my complex idea of the chair. So the simple ideas can combine into complex ideas. And, moreover, different complex ideas can combine with other complex ideas to make even more complex ideas. But ultimately, all of our complex ideas can be broken down into simple ideas that we got through experience. He breaks down complex ideas into three groups. The three groups are substances, modes, and relations. Let's talk about these. Ideas of substance are our, are our ideas about things that exist independently of the mind. Things like desks, chairs, hills, trees, whatever. But ideas of substance can also come in the form of groups. 
groups of building forming a town, groups of individuals forming a basketball team, and so on. Locke says that although we know that substances exist, they will always be a mystery to us because we really don't know what they are ultimately made of. The reason is, is because it's always possible to ask, what is the substance made of? If we say the substance is made of matter, then we can ask, what is matter made of? The next type of complex ideas is modes. Modes are the features of substances. Simple modes combine many simple ideas of the same type together. Things taken merely as objects can be combined to give us the idea of a number. I can see four um, objects on my desk here, and, um, and so that gives me the idea of four things, and I just consider them as just objects. Mixed modes, however, involve combining together simple ideas of different kinds. Add to got together the ideas of property, ownership, the need to survive, and one can construct a moral prohibition against stealing. The last type of complex ideas is ideas of relation. These are ideas that involve more than one substance that have a relationship to one another. In order for me to think about the President of the United States, I need to think of a person a constitution creating an office of the presidency, a collection of people into a nation, the act of voting in its relationship to democracy, and so on. Now, according to, I, to Locke, the best ideas are clear, distinct, real, adequate, and true. Now, bad ideas are obscure, confused, fantastical, inadequate, and false. Clear ideas, like clear images, are crisp and fresh, not faded or diminished in the way that, that obscure ideas and images are. Ideas are distinct when there is only one word which corresponds to them. Confused ideas are ones, to w are ones to which more than one word or words can correctly apply. For example, the phrase spotted beast could apply to either a leopard or an ocelot. Real ideas are those that have a foundation in nature whereas fantastical ideas are those that are created by the imagination. Adequate ideas perfectly represent the thing they are meant to depict. Inadequate ideas fail to do that. Ideas are true when the mind understands them in a way that is correct according to the way the world is structured. Ideas are false when the mind misunderstands them along these lines. So this is some of the things that the Locke has to say about um, epistemology. Let's look at another empiricist now, uh, David Hume. His last name is spelled H-U-M-E. Now, Hume is skeptical about our capacity to know anything. But he is interested in how we form our beliefs. And he thinks that belief can only be analyzed as having two components. Impressions 
and ideas. Impressions are the direct, vivid, and forceful products of immediate experience, says Hume. Ideas are merely feeble copies of our original impressions. Our ideas appear to be connected, but, says Hume, we manufacture the connection in three ways, through resemblance, through contiguity, and through cause and effect. Let's talk about each one of these individually. Resemblance just simply means they look like each other or they resemble each other. The tree, that tree out there in my backyard looks like the other tree in the backyard. Contiguity. That just simply means things bordering each other, things that are closely together. Like uh, my pen is close to my mouse uh, on, on my desk. Cause and effect. We know what that is. Moving the light switch turns the light on and off. These connections, says Hume, are just associations we make and don't necessarily tell us anything about how the world works. Now, like Locke, Hume divided ideas into simple and complex. For Hume, simple impressions and ideas, such as the seeing or imagining of a particular shade of red, admit of no distinction or separation. Complex impressions and ideas, such as seeing or imagining an apple, can be analyzed into its component parts. Simple ideas are derived from and exactly represent simple impressions. But complex ideas do not represent their impressions. Complex ideas result from the associations we make. That means their truth value, or their truthhood, if you, if you will, should be called into question. The reason why we must call the truth value of complex ideas and impression into, into impressions into question is because we can imagine their associations being different without contradiction. For example, I don't contradict myself when I say the sun will not rise tomorrow. So nothing about my complex ideas and impressions are necessarily true. The only reason why we are tempted to think that our complex ideas contain necessary connections is because we develop the habit of making that association based on experience. But our past experience cannot guarantee, says Hume, our future experience. Thank you.